those arcs, I guess, look good at any time of the year. But they looked particularly good to me that spring day I came back. It was a 20-year look I was giving them. That's how long I'd been gone. Going home. That's the song the tires were humming. And for the first time since I'd got the doctor's orders, I felt at peace. Nothing had changed, apparently. Deep cut valleys and timbered hills. The land coming alive with beauty and the promise of plenty. Families were out working on their gardens, doing their part to fulfill that promise. Watching them, I remembered reading somewhere that the finest crop of any land is its people. Nothing had changed. The Ozark country was still being pastured and plowed. And burned, just as it was when I was a kid. Fire, that's something I remembered too well. We had fires all year round, it seemed, but mostly in the spring and fall. I remember my dad forever fighting them, fighting to hang on to his timber, battling to save his fences. worrying over his scorched soil. Sometimes it was Lem Sutter who started the fires that rolled over onto our land. Sometimes it was a hunter who built a fire on a hollow tree to smoke out a squirrel. The tree was left to burn until the wind whipped it up into a real blaze. My father didn't think much of sportsmen who did that. He liked animals too well to see them burned up and he knew the fire destroyed the food and cover for those that were left. My father's biggest worry, however, was Joe Claxton. His land was right near ours, and he used to burn his woods regularly. Joe was mighty set in his ways, and there wasn't any chance of changing him. He thought an awful lot of his cows, and he figured that if he could just get rid of the brush, his cows would have easy picking. He burned the woods year after year, but he never did get rid of the brush. Because every time he burned, it seemed that two sprouts came up where one had been before. And so the brush got thicker and thicker. And Joe's cows got thinner and thinner. Everything reminded me of the past somehow. It was like crossing a bridge over the years. My question, how's fishing, brought a typical answer. The proof of the fishing was on the stringer. But of course, fishing can be good even when catching is poor. Twenty years ago, Hank Andrews, my best friend, was with me the last time I went fishing in Missouri. We kept at it all morning, but all we got was one little old bass. Catching was bad that day, but fishing was fun anyhow. Guess it's fun just to be alive on a bright fall day in the Ozarks. We took the long way home, 
so we could pass the Collins place, we knew that they were boiling down sorghum. Everybody was welcome, whether they sat or helped or just helped themselves to a lick of sweetening. We had our share before we started for home. At the top of the ridge, we saw smoke rising up back of my house. The fire was blazing when we got there. My father and Joe Claxton were raking a line ahead of it. Hank and I pitched in and tried to beat out the flames around the edge. We thought for a while we might lick that fire. My father hitched up the horses to plow a line between the woods and the barn. The fire got away anyhow. Joe Claxton started pulling water from the cistern and my mother brought out all the buckets and pails and pans she could find in the house. Mother, Joe, Hank and I kept on the run carrying water to the barn to soak it down. We must have carried a hundred buckets. But it was no use. And pretty soon we could hardly get through the smoke around the barn. There was nothing to do but stand by helplessly. That fire not only wiped out our barn, it finished my boyhood in Missouri, too. We moved away soon after. My father had given up. It wasn't just the loss of our barn and our hay. Or the ruin of the timber. but the certainty of fires year after year, and the knowledge that no one man could stop them. And now I was coming back, to stay maybe. It was later than I'd planned when I reached Hank's farm, the same farm his father had before him. However, I was welcome. The Ozarks are famous for their hospitality. Mattie, Hank's wife, made coffee and we had what she called a bite to eat. Yes, they thought I had a pretty good appetite for a sick man. I tried to explain that it was a matter of nerves that made me leave my job in Chicago. Talking of nerves, I suddenly had the feeling of being watched. I was being watched, all right. There were three good reasons why Hank looked so contented. Matty, of course, was a fourth. I had to bring out pictures of my wife and youngsters then. I'd planned to look around for a small farm and then send for them. But this business of burning made me wonder. I told Hank so. You don't have to worry, he said. You'll stay. But I wasn't so sure. Next morning, we started looking around the farm. Hank used his good bottom land for corn. 
he had set aside his lower slopes for pasture, and his dairy herd was fat and in good condition. His hills were in timber. He'd kept fires out with the idea of keeping the soil from washing off his steep land. Hank was proud of the thick layer of leaves and litter on the ground. He pointed out that it was both a sponge to hold rain and a mat to protect the soil. It was hard to believe that this land had been just brush a few years ago. But, as Hank said, it takes little trees to make big trees. If you keep fire and cows out of the woods, nature and time will do the rest. Hank made good use of his woodlot. He showed me some of the fence posts he had cut from his trees. But the thrifty trees, those that were making good growth, he'd kept with the idea of getting a timber crop in a few years. Hank took me all around the county the next few days. It seems almost everything we saw tied into fire some way. For instance, on Possum Creek, two or three inches of rain will bring it to flood stage. When normally, Possum Creek is a shallow, silted stream. When it floods, a lot of good bottom land is ruined. Along Possum Creek, the hills have been burned year after year. The soil has washed away until the ground looks as hard as flint and is just about as fertile. On one ridge above the creek, Hank and I walked for 20 minutes through a burned over woods. It was land with a sorry past and not much future, sick land. But West Fork, flowing deep and clear, can absorb a lot of rain without going on a rampage. Even in dry periods, it maintains a fairly steady flow of water. Nobody fishes Possum Creek anymore, but West Fork is a favorite spot for angling activity or inactivity. Possum Creek and West Fork come from the same kind of hilly farmland. What makes them so different is the care given that upstream land, the watershed. In many places, the ridge land above West Fork is coming back into its heritage of trees as the result of fire protection. In an opening, we saw a deer. I'd never even seen one in the Ozarks when I was a boy. found pine planted in many places, some along roads. It was only 10 years old, Hank said, but it reached up 20 to 25 feet. Of all the people we visited, two stand out in my mind. One was Andy Boone. He was working on his new house when we stopped by. Andy is an ex-GI who bought a farm two years ago. He joined a veterans class in agriculture. And what he learned in class about good farming, he's applying on the ground at home. And his fences were pretty well run down when he bought his farm. But he has a good, cheap source of repair material in his woods. With the help of a farm forester, he marked the trees for cutting.
He found he had enough good, full-grown trees to get a supply of lumber, too. He had more time than money, so he did his own logging. He had the logs sawed at a mill in town, and he had enough good lumber to build a new house. Andy makes most of his cash money by working in the woods. Naturally, Andy's teaching his boys to keep fire out of the woods. He figures he's got a permanent storehouse of cash and timber for future needs. A source of supply not only for himself, but for those who will be farming his land after him. The other place that impressed me a lot was the Curtis farm. I remembered Lynn Curtis all right. He was older now, of course, and a lot smarter. Hank says Lynn Curtis has about the finest herd of white faces in this part of the country, and I believe him. Lynn changed his methods of farming years ago. Now he plows under instead of burning over. He uses lime and fertilizers to improve and restore his pastures. and he's made them into lush green banquet tables for his stock. Looking back at Lynn's farm was like looking at a picture, a picture he had created by working with nature instead of against it. Old Joe Claxton's place was quite a contrast. I think I would have known it just from the looks of his cows. It's the same old story with Joe. He burns the brush every year. Joe won't change. Neither will the brush. It's just as stubborn as Joe, and it comes back thicker every year. And the cows don't change much either. They don't get any fatter, and they can't get much thinner. A lot of fires are started by Joe and a few others like him. They account for the smoke screen that hangs over part of the Ozarks every spring and fall. But because of the fire protection system set up a few years back, there's some chance of checking these fires. During dry weather, a regular watch is kept for the first sign of fire. A local man is responsible for lining up fire crews. Other men fight the fires using special tools and equipment. Local cooperation in fighting these fires is absolutely essential to save the Ozarks forest and soil. Another big need is for a lot more people like Lynn Curtis. And Andy Boone. And my friend Hank Andrews. People who will give their lands a break and keep fire out of them. Hank got me to climb a fire tower at the end of our tour. I wasn't so sure I wanted to, but he said I could get a 20-mile as well as a 20-year look from the top. As usual, he was right. The view I got was well worth the climb. Outside the protection district, I could see that fire was taking its annual toll in burned woodland. Flooded bottomland. and poor pastures. Inside the district, it was a different picture, a picture of peace and plenty. Not perfect by any means, but a dream coming true, the dream my father carried in his heart. Of course, there's a big job ahead to make the idea of full protection and full production in this Ozark country a reality. But standing there at the tower window, I knew I wanted a part in it. I knew I was back in the Ozarks to stay.